It is Good Friday, and gosh darn it, we're not going to ignore it. Welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York, and as the subject line shows, it's important that I articulate my state of mind. And on Good Friday, I think it's important to recognize that it is Good Friday. It's one of the strangest days of the year, the most solemn day in the Christian calendar, and yet it is a bonanza day off uh, for a lot of folks. And I have learned not to judge. And with my guests this evening, I'll kind of explain to them why I have learned not to judge, but I am really honored to have some clergy here tonight to talk about the season, what it means, and why it ought to be important to you. Now you've seen Palm Sunday video, right, if you hadn't been to church this past weekend. And those of you who are our Jewish viewers, uh, we always welcome you into the conversation as well. Uh, and in fact, there's some local video of Palm Sunday observances by the Episcopals, which are, you know, the Catholic lights, right? Are we allowed to say that, Bishop? <laughs> How about me starting this? How, how, how about me starting the show in the most disrespectful way I can possibly do it? Can I? Well, I need your version of, of confession by the time I'm done here. Oddly enough, that's not even close to the most disrespectful way we've been described. Bishop Nicholas Nisley is the bishop, the Episcopal bishop here, and um, uh, Jabalani McAllister is the Reverend from the Calvary Baptist Church. We thank you both for, for coming in. Appreciate thank it. You so enough of the news of the day. It is it is the most uh, solemn day in the Christian calendar, but it's really interesting between Catholics and, and, and denominations in the Protestant churches. There are different emphasis and, and, and feelings that are put on the day. So before I start spouting off about what I think about the day, tell me, what does the day mean and the whole Easter season put in perspective on it? So I think if you're going to talk about Good Friday, you have to see Good Friday in its place as part of what we call the Triduum. It's the three holiest days of the Christian year. They begin with sundown on Thursday, Monday, Thursday, where we remember that on that night Christ took the Passover meal, a Jewish tradition, and changed it for us who are Christians in a way that opens up a new understanding of our relationship with God. On Good Friday, Christ died on the cross, was buried. Holy Saturday, he laid in the grave, and sometime between the evening of Holy Saturday and the sunrise on Easter Day, Christ rose again. And it's that journey, that journey from the Passover meal shared with friends to his abandonment, to his death, to the pathos of the grave, to the resurrection that we are remembering. And we begin that three-day journey on Good Friday. All right. Reverend, um, observation from 36,000 feet about this day and this season? Well, I, I agree with the bishop that it is uh, that journey that's important to emphasize. And another thing that is important to emphasize is the great sacrifice that was made by Jesus on good, that Good Friday and not just staying dead, but arising on that Sunday. That's, and, and that's one of the major things, I think, for, uh, for most Christendom to remember because now that, now that he has made that sacrifice, then we have access to that relationship with him through the sacrifice that he made. Mm -hmm. So in addition to what Bishop was saying, um, that's, a, that's an important piece as well. You know, I, I, I have to be careful not to uh, cop an attitude about Good Friday. I, for, background for you guys, I mean, on the radio for years, I stopped the show and made a three-hour commitment to, to Good Friday. The passion mm -hmm. brought kids on. Got a lot of pressure from the company. Didn't like it. You know, doing a, 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 a non-secular type of thing on a very secular radio program, which, of course, is mostly smash-mouth football most mm -hmm. days, right? So, um, so people who know me from the radio know that I've done that. And you also got to be a little bit careful not to get too lofty about how some of us observe the real meaning of Good Friday and mm -hmm. so many others don't. Right. The one thing that I, I, I want you guys to dominate this conversation more than me, but the one thing that came to me one day, in, literally in prayer, and as a terrible sinner, you know, I do pray once in a while. Um, after, after examining what Good Friday actually might have been like factually, historically, nobody else was paying attention to him getting killed either. Right. Nobody was paying attention. So this whole notion and the drama that surrounds the crucifixion, in many ways, 
was an everyday day that day, and it, he's, he was obviously he was a popular criminal, but it's not like the world stopped and watched him die. So when the world is going on and people are going to the mall and they're going to the golf course and they're just doing their thing, it, it brought me some peace that, that actually may reflect exactly what happened on Good Friday. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, absolutely. And, and enough I, of me, but I wanted to hear what you think about Bonhoeffer, that. Bonhoeffer, the sort of great German theologian, talks about his own experience of evil in World War II and as part of the Holocaust, the great catastrophe that affected the Jewish people. And he talks about the banality of evil, how everyday people are capable of monstrous deeds. And sometimes we don't realize what's happening in our midst because we don't have eyes to see what's going on. For us as Christians, on Good Friday, we see that God incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ is hanging on that cross, and no one's really paying attention. And the truth is, it wasn't even that big a deal. It was only three crucifixions that day. It's 40 years later, maybe, as the Roman armies begin their full-scale in the middle of a hundred year war against Judaism in Jerusalem, that they destroy Jerusalem, 60,000 plus people are crucified and the bodies are strung on the hills around Jerusalem. People notice that, mm. but we don't talk about that in the church. Mm. I mean, it, it really is extraordinary. You ever thought about the nonchalance of, of Good Friday and how it's widely ignored? Yeah, I think part of it is because, um, you know, and I, and I know that this probably won't be a popular comment, but I think a lot, in a lot of ways, those of us who are Christian uh, interact with some of the people that you're talking about when you say don't get too lofty. I think a lot of times we have shown a poor example of what Christ was, the love that he has shown. And I think because of that, the world really writes it off. And they're like, if, if that's what being, being a Christian is, if that's who Christ was, I don't want anything to do with that. So I think that that's why it's important for us to show that the example that he had shown when he was on the, on the earth ministering is still real and relevant today. And so I think once we do that, then we'll get beyond people just wanting to take it off to go golf, you know, shopping or whatever, or kick the feet up, which is, you know, part of it, part of the day that it happens, but, you know, it'll get the focus back on the sacrifice that Christ made for that day. And one of those ways in which uh, at least in, in many Baptist churches, we have a service called Seven Last Words Service. Hmm. And we focus on uh, seven preachers preach on seven sayings that Christ said from the cross, from the, from the scriptures, and talk about all of those things and why it's important. And, you know, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do and things like that, emphasizing the importance of it, whether people portray that they hear it or not. That's not our our um, responsibility to force them to hear it. It's our responsibility to share that great sacrifice because of his love for all. Mm. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the idea that you can have an Easter without a Good Friday. You can't figure out how you do that. <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs> Conversation about Good Friday. Uh, and uh, we've kept the production on the program simple uh, tonight, simply because uh, it is in, in very many ways a simple um, spiritual day, solemn day. And it may be, some, what? what are you doing, Dan, having a religious conversation on the program? Well, theology is actually fascinating if you let your, your mind open up a little bit. And even if you're not really experiencing Good Friday the way um, others might, it's still an interesting topic. Uh, Jabalani McAllister is the uh, reverend from Calvary Baptist Church. And we've got uh, Bishop Nicholas Nigely uh, in here today to, to talk a little bit about this. You know, I often, I often just ask this question, and I, I, I'm sure I did on the radio today. We taped this a couple of days ago because these guys are busy on you know, you know, Holy <laughs> Thursday and Friday uh, ministering. Um, people come with their Easter bonnets to services on Sunday. They're all pumped up. There's Easter eggs. The kids are chocolate up and charged up. The families are getting together for ham or whatever else they're doing. Uh, big family celebrations. And it's a beautiful thing because Jesus is risen, correct? Yes. But if you don't do a little Good Friday, I, I'm not sure how you get that celebration and its fulfillment. I mean, talk to me about that. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, you can't get to the celebrations on Easter if you don't have the suffering that happened and the sacrifice that happened on Good Friday. I mean, that's the whole reason, the whole reason why we can celebrate and, and try to live a Christ-like life now is because he rose. If he didn't rise, then the, the whole thing is irrelevant. But because he did rise, then it's important for us to to understand 
that the empowerment he gives us through that sacrifice that happened on Good Friday informs the resurrection and the access that we all have to resurrection because of the sacrifice he made for us. So how do people do it? Well, one of the most one of the most poignant stories I think of the resurrection is when Jesus <coughs> appears to Thomas in the closed upper room and says, you need to put your fingers in the wounds in my hands and in my side so you will understand. The resurrected Jesus carries the scars of Good Friday. Mm -hmm. The scars and the suffering do not go away, but they are transformed into a new meaning. I think for us, as we are making our journey through Good Friday, we have to remember that Good Friday leads us to Easter. There's no yes. other way to get to Easter but through the gate of Good Friday. When I was a parish priest, I, we had these Stations of the Cross that we hung in our congregation. They were somber, they were powerful, and we would traditionally take them down on Easter Day to celebrate the resurrection. One year, the Sunday school director had the children make felt stations of the cross. And I was struck because they had Jesus smiling as he was carrying his cross. And there's a, there's a really deep theological conversation to be had about that. But we put them up on Easter, and someone has, well, we shouldn't have them on Easter. I said, but that's the whole point of Easter. It transforms the suffering that we experience, and it gives it meaning. It isn't simply suffering for no purpose or no rational uh, reason. It's now suffering that is contained within this resurrection. Mm -hmm. We have experienced something of God's love in the difficult journey we pass through. And I think that's what happens in the liturgy. Palm Sunday, for people who don't make it to Good Friday, at least Palm Sunday in the Roman Absolutely. Catholic Church, in the Episcopal Church, other liturgical churches, will have the Passion narrative read now. Because we've recognized not everyone. Do you do that in the it. Baptist Church? Yes. Okay. Are there differences, significant differences, between the reflections, the liturgies, uh, say between Baptists and Episcopals, never mind Catholics? There are, there are wider differences within the Episcopal Church between different Episcopalians hmm. than there are between the sort of the medium of where the Episcopal Church is and the Baptist churches are. And even, uh, even within you know, the Baptist denomination, it is like 60 different ones. Right. And, you know, and then you have different cultural things that are happening. So, for example, in the church I serve now, it's, it's, it's multi-ethnic, multicultural. So there's a lot of those nuances there from when the church was, um, you know, an all-Caucasian church mm -hmm. to now the more international one. There's differences where, uh, as I said, um, some Baptist churches, whether it's an ethnic one or not, observe Holy Week having a revival that entire week and then having that seven last word service, or Monday Thursday service, and then that seven last word service, and it's more celebratory. Are your are your services in general uplifting, very musical, uh, that kind of thing? Some of them are. Um, like I said, if it, some of the more um, uh, congregations of color are more celebratory. I mean, listen, I, I mean, let's yeah. not let's not beat around the bush. It's nothing more fun for me to go to a to a, to a primarily African American uh, Christian church because I. I, I had a close friend of mine years ago uh, uh, who from time to time would just bring me to church. Like I'd go to Mass and then I'd go to the Protestant <laughs> church. And I said to our bishop one day, not this bishop but the prior, I said, you know what, uh, devout Catholic, committed to the faith, but I gotta tell you, it's a whole lot more fun over on this side. Um, and he said, you know what? And then he actually made a, re made a recommendation to me in terms of the parish I should attend because it had a little bit more um, versatility. But there is a spirit uh, that occurs in African-American Christian culture that I think is phenomenal in and, our and hardly duplicated. In our Latino congregations, you'll see that same thing. And I think it's because people who've had to suffer, mm -hmm. people who've been persecuted, people who have been put outside the system understand what resurrection means and understand what deliverance means in a way where people of privilege and people of economic power sometimes have a harder time understanding it. I, I, it's funny, I well, think you'll find that people with yeah, wealth... There's, there's definitely a tension there with yeah. that, yeah. People with wealth find Good Friday more powerful because it's restorative to them, it reminds them of their place, whereas people who are coming out of suffering Live will it. find Easter to be that great moment. Talk to me about, that's, I think that's fascinating. Listen, this short half hour could go on for hours and hours. I, I find this. Have us back. Well, I, 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 <laughs> I, I hope that you'll feel it when we're done that you want to. So this show is airing at 7.30 and 11.30 on Friday night, on Good Friday. Uh, if you didn't make a service or if you didn't formalize your observance of Good Friday and you're watching the show, what do you do? 
There are some wonderful places online to go. The EpiscopalChurch.org will have resources online. You can watch meditative videos. You can hear seven last word sermons preached in different churches from around the country. There are some extraordinary things on Twitter, social media. You know, you could sit quietly and just put aside half an hour or an hour and watch, listen, think, be quiet. See what God has to say. Yeah, but there's also, in the seven last words are usually used like noon to three, Just, you know, going with the historical time when he was crucified. But there's also churches that have uh, gone to a different model, understanding the different schedules and things like that and have offered evening services as well even in you know around Rhode Island there's different churches that do that so and there's always an option you know to go yeah but if you can't go I say here's oh, the thing and this, yeah. is, and this yeah. is where the judgment part I think is going to be very <coughs> careful yeah. as, as those who observe the day for at least the category of solemnity that, it, that it's supposed to bring to them and they and, and uh, say, say somebody gets into a conversation with with, with another about how important the day is, and and, and uh, the person they're speaking with finally recognizes that yeah, yeah I should have paused I should have done something. Mm -hmm. The very idea that you recognize that is is part of it. In other words, it doesn't have to be right. some wailing, screaming, crying, crucifix kissing, kneeling. Our right. God thing. is the God of right. great cosmic do overs. Yeah. Say and that again. Our God is the God of great cosmic do overs. Of forgiveness and if you didn't do it when you thought you should do it when you feel you can because that's what really matters mm. I believe that as well I mean because we spend a lot of time condemning everyone but again people know they they know they messed up every all of us mm -hmm. know that we are not perfect what we need to hear is more of, of Christ's love and if he's looking at the scriptures when he showed up, it wasn't always trying to, uh, you know, cram a Bible down somebody's throat or, or his word down somebody's throat. It was him showing up, loving the people, being in a relationship, and then it just naturally came out in a lot of time, a lot of times. And that's when they were, you know, people were more open, and that's what we have to do: be more open to that. Okay, so you didn't, you didn't make the service. Don't feel guilty about it. As Bishop said, there are other ways that you can connect with God. Um, that, as he mentioned, you know, if you can't make it physically there. Here's a start where you can, and then next time perhaps you'll come. <laughs> Open up your Bible. Mark's Gospel takes about an hour and a half to read. If you read slow, you can make it three hours. You've just had your three hour observance. But read Mark's Gospel. Read one of the Gospels in the Bible. It's an extraordinary story, and every time you read it, you will be changed. So when we come back in about a five or six minute period, we'll have the answer to the question who believes this stuff anyway? Stay with me. <laughs> so, you know, faith is an incredible, it's an incredible conversation. And uh, now I'm going to ask uh, the bishop and the reverend to uh, try to prove to you that it's all, it's all true. You know, this, this whole story of Jesus, this whole historical account of his life on the planet, the idea that, come on, man, he rose from the dead. What up with that? It's, it, it, it becomes, I think, a challenge, even for the most faithful, to always buy in. And for those who don't buy in at all, to even get close to the story. So the strongest argument I think you can make, and I, I speak as a former scientist, I speak as a student of history, the strongest argument you can make is look at the lives of the apostles. Traditionally, all of those apostles, all 12 of them, Matthias, who was added later on in the Book of Acts, all of them gave their lives for what they believed they had experienced in the resurrected Christ. It's, I can imagine one or two people going off and giving their life for something to try and prove a lie. I cannot imagine a dozen people. I can't imagine all the people who followed in their steps and gave their lives. Look at how they changed. In the story of the gospel, they go from not understanding anything, they go from being afraid, they go from completely abandoning Jesus on Good Friday to somehow finding courage and going all out in the world. Thomas by tradition died in India. Peter was crucified head down in Rome because he didn't think he was worthy to be crucified with his head above his feet because that's how Jesus had been crucified. If you hadn't experienced something life-changing, cosmically shifting your understanding of who God was, you wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. What do you think? Yeah, I, I definitely agree that <coughs> there's something that is just transformative about 
what happens. And of course, there's, you know, the, the biblical accounts talk about, you know, the witnesses. But then, as you mentioned, uh, historically, you know, people that try to say that Jesus, some people say that he didn't even exist and all these things. Historically, for example, the Jewish historian Josephus talks about in his writings the crucifixion that happened. And then uh, there's other, you know, historical things that people talk about in terms of his resurrection. But I think w the difficulty comes when you try to broach a topic of faith, as you said, and when we came back again. Because for those of us who do believe, as the bishop said, it's something that happened, well, speaking for myself, that happened to me that, see, a lot of people think because I'm a pastor now that I've always been a Christian. Well, not until I actually interacted with people who I considered, they didn't just tell me they were Christian, I saw them and how they were, and then I experienced it myself, uh, the spiritual transformation that happened that can't even really be articulated in words, but there's just something so enriching about being in relationship with Jesus, and that's why earlier I was saying it's not just about the religious trappings and, and ideo ideologies, but it's about the relationship with Jesus, and I think when people get plugged into that relationship, then that's when their faith will increase. Um, in spite of what happens, in spite of what people say, say or don't say, it's a, it's a, a personal um, grasping of that faith in him. Yeah. Yeah. So give me a 30 second thought for Easter for 2015. Jesus is alive. He was resurrected for us. And uh, it's a glorious thing to know that and to experience that. And I, and I hope that others will see for themselves try for themselves and, and, and get to know him and they'll, they'll see that it's, that it's real and it's true. Bishop? God loves you. God adores you. And because God loves you there is always hope. Even in the darkest part of your life God is with you and God can bring joy and happiness to you. Open yourself to God. Listen to what God is saying in your heart and as you respond you will experience Easter. There you have it. Happy Easter, gentlemen. Happy Easter to Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate God it. God bless you. Final word and we come back. Stay with us. All righty. Welcome back in. Uh, I, you know, I, I just wanted to, to wish you a happy Easter. This is um, something that, you know, on secular broadcast, people don't generally do. And if they do, it's, it's very casual and it's uh, very social cultural. I hope that if you have experienced the solemnity of Good Friday, that you um, uh, have experienced that which you hope to experience. Uh, if you haven't experienced the solemnity of Good Friday because you've just been running around, and by the way, again, there's no judgment about that anymore. I, I, I have no right to, 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 to even suggest that you've made a mistake, and our clergy certainly did a great job of explaining that there's always a second chance. Uh, but go ahead and take a moment. Just take a moment. And I th if you just take a moment, then Easter becomes a celebration. And it certainly should be. So, uh, and I celebrate you for, for watching the broadcast. So I wish you the happiest and holiest Easter that you could possibly have. We'll be back at it for all the rock'em sock'em stuff that we do here. Nightly on Daniel's State of Mind. Have a great weekend.